only mode. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome uh, for um, we welcome you here at our presentation this morning. Um, I think we're about five minutes behind. I apologize for that. We were. <laughs> my presentation was coming up in German. Um, so anyway, so we got that little glitch fixed, and so now we're ready to start. So I promise you it'll be worth your time, and so we are going to start. First of all, um, this is the Women's Business Development Center, of course, and the topic is strategies for writing dynamic capability statements. Um, I'm the director um, of the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, and um, Kristen Travis is here with me, and she is the PTAC associate. We also have a guest presenter that we're very excited about, and that is Adrian Callahan with the Environmental Protection Agency. So we're going to get started. And the way it works, if you have some questions, I think any of you that have been on webinars before, you can write in your questions, and we will try to answer them. Um, and if not, if we run out of time, then you can always send us an email afterwards, and we can answer, get some answers for you. This is Frida. I am on the left. Adrian Callahan is on the right. We thought you'd appreciate seeing our lovely pictures this morning. So first of all, um, for those of you that are not familiar with the Women's Business Development Center, we've been around for 27 years, and we are an organization that works with men and women-owned businesses, and we assist new businesses, emerging businesses, established businesses with the variety of programs and services that we have available. Um, one of the big ones, it includes free business counseling, and all of our counselors are uh, entrepreneurs or have some strong entrepreneurial experience. We have the PTAC Center, which is what um, we are, which is what I'm the director of, and we work with the businesses that are particularly interested in doing business with government agencies, whether that's city, county, state, federal um, government agencies. And so we have a variety of services that are geared just for government contracting. We have a small business development center, so within that center, we've got some entrepreneurial training programs, individual counseling. We have a small, uh, we have a micro loan program. We have a veterinary program for women-owned um, vets. Um, we have a child care business program. We have a Latina program. So we really provide a wealth of services across the board to help new emerging and established businesses to move to that next level of growth, whatever that happens to be for them. Before we get into the topic of today, which is capability statements, writing them, why they're important, why they're so dynamic, I'm excited that we have our guest presenter, Adrian Callahan who is the Small Business Specialist and the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program Manager for the U.S. Um, uh, Environmental Protection Agency in this region, which is Region 5. So in that role, she's responsible for um, making sure that small businesses have an opportunity to do business with her agency. Um, she's responsible for the socioeconomic programs in that region and also with um, assistance with financial assistance programs. Um, Adrian is actually um, going to um, tell us a little bit about EPA in terms of what kinds of uh, procurement that they do, and then she is going to lead the conversation. She's going to introduce the conversation around um, capability statements. The reason why I am and you should be excited about the fact that Adrian has joined us is because she is the type, she is the position in her role. She is the role. She's the person that you would want to make sure that um, you have a good capability statement to present to her. She's the one that could help you to um, that you could get a chance to meet um, and to present your business in front of her. So I felt that having her as part of this presentation is essential because she's the one who really looks at the capability statements um, when you're going in and trying to do business with her agency, her, and then the other um, small business specialists in her position. And all federal agencies have small business specialists. So I'm going to let Adrienne take over, and she's going to talk about EPA and what they buy. Good morning, everyone. As you'll see on the slide, uh, we buy a wide range of products and services uh, for particular emphasis. I um, want to make sure that everyone understands that we uh, buy things from office supplies all the way up to uh, environmental uh, remediation, removal type services. We are not in the business of buying asbestos abatement. Those types of things are handled at the state level by either the um, state environmental uh, agency or by city and county governments. We do uh, buy 
uh, IT services and products, things that uh, support the um, regional staff and the agency's mission. Uh, we buy lab equipment. We do have a lab in uh, the Chicago area uh, that can range from you, your test tubes all the way up to some of your more uh, specialized uh, scientific equipment, such as a gas chromatograph. Uh, one of the things I've learned to um, <laughs> pronounce correctly. Uh, we also um, listed our primary NAICS codes. Uh, they're typically those that are doing business with an EPA or trying to do business with EPA. Those NAICS codes are the ones that we are uh, most times searching for or listing our solicitations under those particular NAICS codes. We do have others. But in terms of our major contract actions, those actions over uh, $100,000 or even those over $25K that what you would see listed in Fed Biz Ops, they're typically uh, under those particular next codes that you see listed on the slide. Next slide. There you go. And for us, uh, in terms of finding vendors, uh, it is my primary responsibility, you know, to help and make sure that vendors are registered in our federal um, databases. Of course, you all know those are FedBizOps, the, the, the primary, making sure that you're there, CCR.gov, um, excuse me, SAM, uh, utilizing SAM. But for one, one of the things I want to highlight, the, beginning in February, yeah, February 1st, we will will also be posting many of our solicitations in FedConnect. If you all have not registered in FedConnect, it would be you know, worth your time to start uh, registering there. There are other federal agencies that are utilizing FedConnect and have been utilizing FedConnect. But for EPA, we are beginning that process of uh, posting our solicitations there. Things over $25,000 will continue to be listed in FedBizOps Fed as well. But to get a larger picture, even for some of the smaller opportunities, you would need to be registered in FedConnect um, to give you a better advantage in terms of seeing what EPA is posting. Of course, uh, most of you should be familiar with federal supply schedules, uh, again, more commonly known as the GSA schedule. EPA is heavy users of the GSA schedule. And as you get into the discussion about your capability statements, we oftentimes look for um, a GSA schedule or rather a, a federal supply schedule number. Uh, typically, uh, for most IT firms, you'll see you know, Schedule 70. Uh, for EPA, uh, there, you know, there's a, a, a range of schedules, but in, in general, that environmental consulting or environmental engineering are, are typically the schedules that we are looking for. Uh, those you know that could be be potentially qualified to do the type of work that EPA is seeking. Additionally, our um, EPA prime contractors, when we're reviewing their subcontracting plans, we do take a look at the the vendors that they've been using and the types of services and or products or supplies that they have been providing for that prime contractor. That helps us identify things that may, in the long term, uh, become things that we may want to directly contract for. So again, if you've got that past performance with uh, some prime contractors, you know, just bear in mind to make sure that the EPA or whatever agency you're, you're seeking to do business with has an idea that you, you know, perform work as a sub for these particular prime contractors that have held contracts with directly with the agency. For EPA Region 5, we do hold uh, capability uh, sessions. And these are one-hour sessions uh, where the business is invited in by me uh, to sit down face-to-face -face with the program staff and with the um, contracting staff. These sessions, again, are structured in a way uh, to give you some one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, you can uh, present your capabilities and spend the, the last half hour you know, um, taking questions or asking us questions that you may not have the opportunity to ask during a 10 or 15 minute matchmaking session or in a brief encounter where you're passing me your business card. 
But these sessions are designed to give you a better uh, view or better uh, experience with EPA as a whole, um, structured around your business, your business capabilities, and again, you'll find out more, you know, in terms of the value of having a polished capabilities uh, statement. Because before I invite you in for a capability session, I will request that you send me a capability statement so that I can try to get the right people in the room. Again, you're not just talking to the contracting folks who are awarding the contracts and administering um, those contracts. You're also talking to the program staff, those that are you know, over the projects, those that ha hold the money that is assigned to these projects, and again, can determine uh, for, future, you know, um, for future solicitations whether or not this is something that should be you know, let for a small business, large business, or whatever particular type of small business. Again, past performance on other government contracts. These are things that we look for uh, when we're you know, searching for vendors. And then we also encourage teams. A lot of our projects, um, we, we've had small businesses come in together uh, with other small businesses and or other uh, large businesses because they may not have the capacity to handle some of our contracts. Some of our larger contracts are three to five year contracts. Uh, we were talking you know, several hundred million dollar contracts. And they require, you know, owning your own equipment, being able to get to a particular site within, um, you know, our six-state um, geographic area, and um, you know, a multitude of uh, services that your company may not necessarily have all of the expertise. Um, but it is what you know one of the areas where we say you know consider teaming because we have had some successful teams participate in our EPA contract opportunities. Is this me, Frida? Yes, this is um, Adrian. This is going to be you for the next until we get to. Um, hey, Bill. I'm going to have you take it all the way through until we get to key points to remember in your statement. So you'll see this is about the next four slides. All righty. All right. See, and, and being flexible. One, th one thing about working, working with and for the government is, is the ability to be flexible. Our federal spending goals, these are the federal government spending goals. These are the small business goals as well as the social economic categories for the entire federal government. 23% small business, 5 for uh, this small disadvantaged businesses, 5% for women-owned businesses, 3% for hubs zone, and 3% for service-disabled veteran-owned businesses. Now, in comparison, you do have some agencies that have larger goals. For us, our goal uh, for, for small business is 42.15%, and we have typically attained that. But again, you need to understand those goals. When you are trying to do business with uh, federal agencies, understand your targets. You know, you need to identify um, if you are a prime contractor uh, and you're primed and ready to do business directly with the federal government, you have the capacity, you have the skills, the staff, uh, et cetera, then you, your target would be the agency. If you, you know, are not quite ready to do business with with the agency, you don't have the full capacity, maybe you don't have the bonding levels. It could be a number of factors. Don't get discouraged. You need to be marketing yourself to those prime contractors, letting them know that you, you understand or you've gone through uh, agency forecasts and see that they've received a contract for XYZ uh, a, you know, award and you want to make sure that uh, you're letting them know that you have services that could be valuable for their specific um, subcontracting needs. As a team member for several uh, vendors, uh, consider this. You know, it, I, I often hear, "Well, we went to we went to this prime contractor, or we told this small business that we wanted to participate with them as part of their team." They got information from us, and they submitted a, a bid, but now, you know, they're not utilizing us. Well, these are things that you do need to bring up, but you also need to know 
that's, that's the nature of the beast. That's the nature of the business that you're in. Uh, be careful and selective. We do not conduct marriages. However, we are here to, you know, help advise you and help you understand that there are businesses out there that are looking for teaming partners. And we have seen some successful teaming arrangements, but you also need to make sure that you're, you know, appropriately documenting whatever teaming arrangements you have in place. Uh, and again, if you're going into a joint venture scenario, making sure that you're checking in with your SBA uh, representatives who are the official agency to make sure that uh, a joint venture is documented and processed appropriately. In terms of um, expectations for me as a small business um, specialist, when I'm meeting you and we're looking, you know, you're, you're submitting a business card, I call that again, you know, that's your less than five minute introduction. But it's also a lasting introduction. Uh, for someone like me, I receive a lot of business cards, take them back to my office, and uh, typically I'm, I would send a follow-up email to let you know, you know, it was a pleasure meeting you. Uh, if you requested some information from me, I'm, I'm jotting that down on the back of that business card. But um, the things that you see on the slide, these are suggestions that I've made at different meetings, events, et cetera, things that I've found uh, that folks do not, you know, include on their business card. And, and these are things that, you know, you, you know very simple. You know, it's not about making sure that you've got the, the um, best type of um, paper that your business card is on, but, but the value of the information on the card. And don't be afraid to utilize the back side of that card, especially when it comes to listing your NAICS codes and or uh, any other GSA schedule, your SIN number, uh, those valuable numbers and certifications that we would be looking for. And I'm sorry, Frida, because my screen has locked and I cannot see what the, oh, I'm sorry, here we go. Capability statement. When you have a capability statement, um, it should be a one pager. Please, I cannot stress enough that a capability statement is not a statement of qualifications. It is not um, your 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 capability. You know your presentation for a capability session. It is a statement. It should not be longer than one page. As you'll see on here, it should be a summary of your firm's capabilities. Just a quick snapshot. Target it for your customer. You may be trying to. Uh, uh, target state, federal, and local government. All of us may not have the same needs. Uh, generally, we do not. You might have one that's, sell that's tailored for federal government agencies, you know, several of us, but please make sure that you are targeting that capability statement. You know, if you need to do one for federal government, one for state, one for city, county, whatever, please do that. And if you have several lines of business, you need to tailor your capability statement for the agency that you're talking to. Um, for, for example, we do not buy janitorial services. Oftentimes we have firms that provide janitorial services and sell a green product that can be used um, or that is promoted by EPA. That janitorial service has nothing to do with us. We, again, buy our janitorial services, or rather our janitorial services are handled by GSA or whomever is the owner of the building that we are housed in. So that, again, you know, when you're talking about a capability statement, tailor it for the audience that you're speaking to. Include information that we would be looking for. Don't include that extra information uh, about janitorial services and, and that extra paragraph. Save that time and expand upon the things that align with EPA's mission or uh, the products or services that you know that we would likely be purchasing. Let us know how you are a step ahead of the competition. Again, if you are a small woman-owned business, let us know that you are a small woman-owned business and not just that you you know you you uh, are XYZ business and this is the type of service or product that you provide. 
A capability statement is required by many agencies. Um, it is not, you know, for, for some, very few, uh, but it is a great way for you to introduce yourself to the agency besides what we will pull if we go through SAM, looking at a, a, a CCR profile, pulling down uh, what what uh, your, your um, past performance may have been. Again, let us see that snapshot of you through through your eyes, through your words about your particular expertise and or the products or services that you provide. For primes, many of our primes do require a capability statement. I often have some of our prime contractors uh, follow up with me following our annual November conference and ask me, you know, I met XYZ firm at, at your conference. Can you send me their capability statement? I do have a business card from them, but I, I also was wondering if you had some additional information. I don't necessarily want to call them because I don't want to be misleading with them, but do you have that capability statement so I can have uh, some more uh, information for them? Again, that capability statement is your marketing piece. It lets us know who you are, where you're located, um, contact information, and more information that, again, Frida will be going into the details of what you need to include. Next slide. You want me here too, Frida? Yeah, this this we can just wrap it up because this is a repeat of some of the things you've already said. One okay. page, it needs to look nice. Good grammar and spelling. Have you run into that as a problem, uh, Adrian? Uh, yes, we do have contracting officers who. Um, <laughs> yeah, we we actually had one um, uh, this week <laughs> that let me know. You know, um, they can't even spell this right. You know, th th these are things that. Um, you know, just 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 bear in mind while it, it, it may not be a reflection of your qualifications to go out and, and handle an oil spill, it does go to your um, your 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 business and and you know your ability to address you know small administrative details. Again, you're working with a federal agency. You know there's going to be a number of things that you're going to have to put in writing, some paperwork, et cetera, to process. Good grammar and spelling is, of course, going to be an important factor, something not to be overlooked. The other thing, too, that at the top we want to make sure that it all matches. So you, if you've got a couple of logos you're playing with and then you have a different look on your business card from your website, from your case statement, then um, it doesn't look like there is cohesiveness between all of your pieces and your branding. So you want to make sure that it all kind of interacts and make sure make, that they match, basically that they match. So what you are presenting to people, that it matches what you're saying and that it all looks the same. <clears throat> and you want to make sure it's also current. You know, sometimes you may feel like you've done this. I think uh, Adrian mentioned earlier that this is a, you know, this is a breathing, moving, living document, and so you don't want to write it and then feel like I've done it, and then, but if the information is not current, and then you're in front of Adrian making a presentation and saying, oh, 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 I've changed that, does not bode well. So you want to make sure that the document that you're giving to people is current and with all of the current information that represents your company. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go and um, Adrienne's going to pop in whenever she feels like she needs to pop in to um, elaborate. And then I'm going to, Chris is going to do a real quick check to see if we have any questions before we move. Because what we're going to do now is kind of go into the details of what's in that CAPE statement. Uh, so, so far I see that you guys have asked um, questions about the webinar, if it will be uh, sent to you. We will send the uh, webinar to you, the webinar slides to you. Uh, once we have a survey, um, we're going to collect that survey and we'll send the slides to you upon completion of that survey. Uh, so if you guys have any other questions, feel free to type them in and we'll answer them as we go along. Okay. So when you talk about a CAPE statement, of course it is an individual document and of course you know, different folks, statements are going to look different from each other. But there's some core information that Adrian went over that you want to make sure is included in your capability statement. So um, I've got 
a couple of samples that I'm going to show you, but first I want to walk through the, uh, what, what the feedback that I've received from the uh, um, government representative, small business specialists like Adrian, is that we want to talk about the core competencies. We want to talk about what differentiates you from the, everybody else that's out there. Past performance, of course, is very key. And company data. So sometimes when we're working with clients who are putting together the case statement, they're thinking, well, I can't put all that good stuff in just one page. I mean, I've got a five or 10 or 20 page brochure that I need in order to get all that information in there. Well, the reality is, as Adrian said, this is just a snapshot. You get a chance in your presentation, assuming you get that presentation, um, to really go into deep detail. But on this CAPE statement, what you want to do is look at how you can generate interest by the person that you're presenting it to. And of course, they will be interested because they get a look at how you can provide value. And so you're not trying to get all those details in there, but you do want to make it compelling. You want to make it thorough. You want to make it complete but you only want to make it one page. And it has to be a font size that's readable. So you can't put it in five point type to get it all in one page. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to go through briefly each section and then I just have a couple of CAPE statements that we've received from some of our clients who've told me that it's okay to share um, that I'll show you. And I'm not saying that they are the best of the best, but I am saying that they do demonstrate how you want to, how you can get that information in there in a way that can um, have you to present yourself to a firm so that you can be in a better position to get that next presentation and then ideally, you know, a contract down the line. So I have a couple of case statements I want to show you just to, so you have the framework while I'm doing the other conversation. You can open the whole one of them. I know. Not this one. Oh. Oh, okay. Good morning. Okay, <laughs> so here's a let's not make it smaller. This is another There we go. Okay. All right, now I can see what I'm showing you. Okay, so this is a this is a statement. So she starts off with her um Oh, the other thing, too, is that you want to make sure that you put your branding on it. So even though we have the template that we're recommending, the template includes your branding, your identification. So here, this firm is talking about their core competencies. And so she really, you know, in one sentence tells us what it is that they do. And the assumption here is that she is presenting this capability statement to um, an agency that's interested in the kind of services that she has. So this is what she's really good at. She also broke out her core services. And so I think this firm, they can do a number of things, but they decided for this particular statement, these are the services that they were going to focus on. Couldn't help themselves. They mentioned some of the other ones. But here, here's our core service, and here's what they are feeling like they're, the person that they're giving this to is going to be interested in, in seeing. Then she's got her branding here. She's got her contact information here. Um, it's interesting. Sometimes people will spend a lot of time and put together a really nice um, tape statement, but then they forget to put the contact information on there. She's got her contact information. Talks about her past performance. In this case, she's had some contracts. She's able to give a little bit of description about the contracts. We'll talk about past performance more when I go back to the slides. But here, I just want to illustrate for you that you can get this information here. Some more about her company data. And here's what differentiates her. So in her industry, 
these are important differentiators, uh, I'm assuming. I don't know her industry, but this is what she has decided would differentiate her from others that do the same kind of work that she does. She also wanted to put in here some of her awards and recognitions, which really speaks to her, um, the fact that she does work that people are satisfied in and she's got some broad experience. And then here she talks about some of her next codes, her numbers, her little stats that are really important. She puts in the branding, the logos for some of the areas that she thinks will be of interest to the audience in which she's sharing this. And I want to show one more. So this is another firm. You can see here it looks completely different. Um, but we got some nice branding up there. And we have the name of the firm, when they were established. We talk about some of their classifications. They put theirs up front. They talk about their areas of expertise. And so here you can see completely different layout from the other one, but still in a way that the information is succinctly presented. We talk about, he talks about what differentiates him with his firm. Um, and they do, their whole thing is around ecosystems and, and um, talks about some of the notable clients. Now, unlike the previous one, he doesn't really give any information about it. She actually gave a little bit of information about some of the other clients. Um, I'm going to ask Adrian when, when I pause her recommendation on that, but it seems to me that, that if you can give information without giving up any kind of proprietary information, it's nice, I think, if you have a little bit more than just the list. Um, and then he just talks about some of his private clients. And from the world of landscaping and what he does, some of the um, things that are really important, including his prior training. Now, in this case, one of the things that he did, he took advantage, it's one page, but on the second page, since for his particular business, the results become really important, so he did take the liberty of putting pictures on the back because he does this whole ecosystem, and in Chicago, he's on the lakefront, and you can go walk around and see some of the work that they've done. So he felt that it could be a benefit to put the pictures on the back, but still stand within the parameters of what is preferred by making sure that the front of it, the data piece, he followed the one page. So we'll go back to the presentation. Okay. All right, so I talked about the core competencies, and here, like I said, if you have questions, you know, type them in, the core competencies. And so, basically, we're just doing a short introduction, talking about how, what it is that you're known for, what it is that you do that's really important, what it is that you do that gets contracts, what it is that you do that really represents um, the value that you bring, that you put that up there in, in the beginning. I think that that should go in the beginning of your... Um, capability statement. So someone's asking, this is a good point here, when we get to the past experience, somebody's asking, um, you know, what happens if you're a new company and you don't have past contract experience? My, what I tell clients is that if you don't have, if you're a brand new company, so you don't have any kind of contracting experience, one of the things that you might want to do is really look at your the expertise that you bring in that you're bringing to this business and how that might match in terms of uh, we I know we're talking about past performance but how that past performance maybe you got it when you were on a job gaining that experience so even though you don't have any contracts you can talk about your past experience maybe you worked on projects um, the reality is it's not as strong because you don't you can't really illustrate that you have experience working on contracts. But when we get to that session, I'm going to let Adrian talk a little bit about that more. But anyway, so the core competencies, that's where you just say, here's, here's who we are, and you say succinctly, and you get people excited right from the beginning. Okay? The next section that we talked about is um, go. the company data. So you saw the different approaches that each one of those um, um, forms that I showed you use, but we need to know some of the facts about the company beyond, you know, your differentiators and beyond some of the um, descriptive kind of things, but what are the facts about the company that, once again, are relevant? So what's your DUNS number? When you're dealing with, for example, the federal government, they like DUNS numbers. They like CAGE codes. You got them, put them on there. They like NAICS codes. Um, if you are going to use your capability statement, say, for corporate contracting, they may not care as much about the DUNS number, but they do care about your socioeconomic certifications. They will care about your NAICS codes. They will care about maybe some of the other things as to whether or not um, 
anything that you've determined based on your research that that corporation finds of value that's related to your company data, then you want to make sure you include it. So the company data is you know, pretty straightforward, but you just want to make sure you put it in there um, as part of presenting yourself on the CAPE statement. So past performance, I'm going to ask Adrian to pop in. Um, the person asked, you know, what if you're a new company and you don't have past contract experience or awards? Do you have any insight that you want to add to that, Adrian? I don't mean to put you on the spot, so if you don't, you can just say yeah or nay. Uh, for past performance, you can still go into um, your, you, you know, elaborate more on your expertise. Uh, again, we know there are new companies that are com coming out and, and, you know, stepping into the arena and, and, and trying to get their foot in the door. Um, that's when you expand on your expertise, whether it's, um, uh, it, it, it could be that, that you've done work in other areas. It could be that you have, um, it, you know, you, you're a biologist and you were certified in whatever scientific theory or, or something of that nature, finding that other niche that would give uh, more credibility to the type of business that you have and the expertise or the qualifications that you have. Again, the capability statement is a, a mini resume of your business. And whatever you can include in that resume to sell to the to the agency, let us know what you do, how you are qualified to handle um, whatever particular project uh, or service. Those are the types of things we need to see in there. Again, don't let past performance uh, deter you. Uh, but if you do not have past performance, I think you should also manage your expectations and go on the fact that without that past performance, you should be looking for some of the smaller opportunities in any way that you can get your, your foot into the door. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, and I know that I did, um, I presented at an event that Adrian had a few months ago and there were some other small business specialists in the room. And one of the other things that some of them, and you know, of course it depends on the agencies, and in addition to what Adrian said, um, some of them did say that one of the things they liked to see with the past performance was the fact that you had the ability to handle the kind of projects that they thought that they may be delivering. And so I think that, again, supports what Adrian said about manage your expectations. And if you don't have it, you don't have it. So then what you need to do is what do I have and then how can I leverage that? Maybe it's teaming, maybe it's going for the under 25,000 projects so that I can begin to get it. Um, so it doesn't mean you can't compete, but it means you do have that um, additional challenge that you have to strategically figure out um, how to get over it. I want to back up, I'm, I'm not going to back up the slide, but for the um, company data, one of the, in one of the other slides we talked about when you, um, we suggested that you not use Gmail or Yahoo emails. And I think part of that just goes to your, um, to the perception that the person that you're giving this to will have about the firm. It's easy enough <clears throat> to get um, a URL that has your company name in it or something beyond the public free Gmail Yahoo. Many feel that that just does not instill confidence or it doesn't make it seem like you're legitimate yet or it doesn't make it seem like you're a real company if you're still using those emails that are not attached to your business. Any, do you agree with that, Adrian? Um, for me, it, it um it doesn't matter if it if it has that the Yahoo or Gmail extension, uh, but bear in mind that for our government systems, a lot of times the Yahoo or Gmail extensions may be blocked. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to contact me, um, you know, with our filters being what they are now, it, it's it's hard enough with uh, some of the business extensions, but those, um, you know, would typically at least reach me, but we are finding more and more that with our government filters, your Yahoo, your AOL, uh, your Gmail, those personal um, email extensions are, are not um, reaching our email addresses. Okay, so just make life easier on yourself and 
get a business, in my opinion, that's just my recommendation, doesn't really cost that much and why not, why risk the fact that not only, and even for Adrian said it doesn't bother her, but I know for some people it does, and so why, why take the chance? Because you don't really know the preferences of the person that you're presenting your business to. I know when clients come into me even, and I'm not even out there in the procurement world, I'm a little surprised when I see at Yahoo or at Gmail or at AOL.com when they are sitting across from me saying that they're established business owner. So I, I just, my preference, even though I'm not a, on the government side like Adrian, is that you just get a business email. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, so I want to spend a few slides on um, differentiators. And sometimes for um, clients, this is the most challenging section because you may say, well, you know, I'm the biggest, I'm the best, I'm the strongest, I'm the fastest, I've got the best quality, I'm the this, I'm the that. But some of those things don't really mean a whole lot because there's nobody who says that I'm ordinary. So you really want to think about what differentiates you. And if you happen to be in a business where there are a lot of you, like there are a lot of people that paint walls, there are a lot of contractors, there are a lot of IT people, you know, so there are a lot of other firms out there similar to yours. So sometimes it can be challenging, especially if you all do kind of the same thing. You know, a painter paints walls, and of course he's then he does a phenomenal job of painting walls, but, you know, how does his wall painting, you know, differ from your wall painting? So part of, so sometimes this can be challenging, especially if you're in an industry where there are a lot of you out there. And in most cases, I think there are. There's a lot of competition across the board for these contracts. So these are just some tips on how you might look at approaching that section. And again, Adrian, feel free to pop in. So with the differentiators, you know, we're talking about, like everything else on this one-page document, we want it to be succinct. But the thing that comes through again and again and again is that you really want it to focus on the customer's needs. And so whoever you are presenting this to, you've done your research, hopefully. You know what sort of gaps they have and what you're looking to fill in. So when you talk about your differentiators, you really want to, you really want to focus on the, those needs. Um, and it could be a big or a little differentiated. It doesn't have to be like this major huge thing, but you just it's something that's important to the client. It could be as little as, you know, maybe you are, um, have a, a, a service that requires attention, you know, where your client might want to sit with you in person, even though a lot of the work, a lot of the service delivery may be done on the phone or in email, but you have a client that really sometimes likes the idea that you can pop in and sit at the desk with them elbow to elbow. Well, maybe what differentiates you from the other 25 people that do the same kind of thing that you do and who are good just like you are is the fact that you are local and that you are easily accessible. And if the client wakes up at 8 o'clock and wants to see you at 9 o'clock, they can see you. So maybe one of your di differentiators may be geographic, um, but you also may have other kinds of differentiators where you've got a patent on something or you've got a new technology that only you know how to use. But whatever it is you want to think through and you want to base it on whatever it is that your, your, your target is looking for. So you want to highlight the benefits of that. If you have some metrics, like I'm with 20% faster or whatever those metrics might be, that can separate you from the others. And I'll tell you some of the things that aren't really good differentiators. So you want it to speak to the requirements, as I said, speak to the you know to the person that you're targeting so you may find that in your CAPE statement you get different differentiators for different targets. How about that's a lot of difference in there. So you know if you're trying to figure out well, how you know I'm still having a hard time because that like I said my clients that come in they tend to be challenged with that section. I say, you know if you're telling me that I can't say I'm the best and the greatest and the fastest then what well, fastest might be good. But the best, you know good quality then what else? And so, you know, like, is it located near your targeted agency? Or think about the customers who bought from you. That's always good to go back. Why did they like me? You can ask them, what, what made you pick me over the other firm that you, that you didn't pick? You know, what was it that stood out as far as you were concerned? Was it my price? Was it my variety? Was it the people? You know, what is it um, that made me stand out? Um, so, you know, when you're looking at you know, solid things about what makes you distinctive from the other ones. That's what you want to look for. Um, why are your products better solutions than the other ones? Think it through. Talk to competitors. Talk to your staff. Talk to friends to say, what is it about my products that make it a better solution than something else? So sometimes you may figure you have to dig 
to get some answers because it may not be really apparent, but you, 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 that's, an important, that's important enough to take the time to figure out what differentiates you. They're not generic statements. I'm better than. We're better than. They're, you know, they're not some static, something that never changes. It's not a one size fits all. It's not your quality people unless you can talk about how your quality people, as a result of the quality people that you have, you're able to do something differently than some of the other, than your competitors can. Otherwise, everybody says they have quality people, services, and products. So if you're going to say that, you have to sort of prove it in a sentence. Um, it always makes it always makes me chuckle when I see something that says, you know, we've got 200 years of experience in our team. Really? It doesn't sound like a plus to me. It actually sounds like you've got a bunch of people that are really old working on the team, and why is that a differentiator? Your socioeconomic certifications are really important, and you're going to put those in there, because for a lot of agencies, that's really important for them to meet agencies and corporations to meet their goals. You definitely want to have it in there, but you don't want that to be what you hang your differentiator hat on. That's nice. That's important. But that is, how does that differentiate you from the next 8A certified firm or the next 200 8A certified firms that are certified just like you are in your industry? Solution providers, that's a phrase that people use a lot. Um, agencies and corporations certainly are looking for providers of solutions, but you need to elaborate on that. Just throwing out there solution providers, best in the class, with quality people, those are sentences I've seen where people are talking about what differentiates them. So you really want to go deeper than just coming up with the kind of low-hanging fruit words that aren't necessarily going to make you distinctive. Adrian, you have anything to add to that? I agree. Okay, cool. Um, we're going to stop to see if we have any other questions. We're going to pause for a minute. Nope, no other questions. Okay, next. Well, actually, I've got flipping the page here for a minute. I've got a few more slides, but a lot of it is sort of going back and reiterating what we've said before. So, um, you know, we've given you some tips on the capability statement tips. Or one of the things you want to call it a capability statement. I, mean, I think particularly for the federal government, some of the other corporations or some of the other local agencies may not be as, you know, focused on that. But for the federal government, they like the term capability statement. That's what they resonate with. So sometimes if I have somebody who's creative and they come in and want to call it, you know, dynamic marketing piece or they want to call it all about me or whatever, that's okay, but you got to have capability. That's okay, but I recommend, because you don't have to, but I recommend that you still also have capability statements part of the title. And then you can elaborate if you want to put some other thing that sort of speaks to you in terms of your branding, but you want to have that capability statement up there. We talked about core competency, past performance, and differentiators, showing the contact information, creating a document to make it relevant for who you're going after, whether it's an agency or a corporation or a prime or even a teaming opportunity. You know, if you're trying to present yourself to some other firms to say that I think we'd make a good teaming partner, that capability, that succinct document is nice to have. And you also want to distribute it as a PDF because you want it to be easy um, for the agencies in particular to open up. They're not interested in opening up heavy documents. Any questions? This is pointing to one. Uh, so the question we have is, does WBDC offer assistance with writing and reviewing capability statements? Yes, we do. We encourage you to come uh, and send your capability statements to us prior to sending them in to any small business specialists um, or contracting officers. We can always review it and give you suggestions um, prior to that and help you to really develop your capability statement uh, so it's the best presentation of who you are. And sometimes even um, when Adrian's available, we'll shoot it to her and, and have her give her input, not necessarily, even if you're not interested in EPA, but she'll just give her. She's always willing to share her thoughts as to whether or not she thinks it's strong as it's been written. Um, you want to use these tape statements when you go to these networking events. You don't want to go in there without them, my recommend, my opinion. Um, usually with these procurement events, and procurement events are like the state of Chicago has one. They have their annual procurement event coming up in May. Um, SBA just had one yesterday. 
Um, you want to look around, uh, I think the uh, state of Illinois had one scheduled, but they had to cancel it. But those are what I mean by procurement events, when you'll get an opportunity to go and meet some of the representatives from the agencies. Unfortunately, corporations don't tend to have them as much. An individual corporation might have an opportunity, but they don't have like the big events where you can go. So like even at the SBA event that happened yesterday, Adrian was there from EPPA, Department of Energy was there, um, GSA was there, and so oftentimes at these procurement events you're going to get a chance to meet a variety of different um, types of agencies and people, so you always want to be prepared, and many times you will know in advance what agencies or what, what agencies or departments are going to be there, so that can give you a chance maybe to do a couple different iterations of your capability statement to make sure that, that you, you are making it match the first person that you want to talk to when you get there. When you're sending information to um, government personnel via email, that's what one exciting thing about doing business with the federal government is that all of the agencies have small business specialists and their job is to, you know, to work with you, um, to be a resource for you, um, to be a place where you can send that kind of information. They're busy, so that doesn't mean that they'll necessarily turn around the day they get it, but it's there, that's part of the system, and you can always follow up and talk to them. Unlike, for example, the state of Illinois, which has some regulations and laws in place where you can't really present information to them, and so that's why when you're at those networking events, you want to have your thing, your information ready to hand. Um, and you give it to personnel, business folks, team partners. It's, it's your document, you use it, and you keep it fresh. I've already said this. Um, website, you got to have a website, in my opinion. There, I've run into a few companies who don't. But they tend to be folks that are still new with their business, but it, you can get websites for almost free. So it's my, my recommendation that if you're in business, you have a website, even if you're new in business, and you get what, even if it's a four-page starter website. A lot of agencies, a lot of corporations, a lot of primes, a lot of people that are considering you for teaming, they go to the website as their place to get information. Do a couple of things to make sure that you are indeed a valid business to make sure that they can get a little bit more information beyond your business card and your capability statement to see if they want to continue to have conversations with you, um, to see what it looks like, to see how you represent what you do. So websites a must for your business. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. And you want to have prepared for when you're doing these networking events and you get your CAPE statement, a nice 30 second elevator pitch, a one minute and a five minute. You know, say you do your 30 seconds, it's concise and somebody's interested. Tell me a little bit more. You get a chance to do a one minute so you can add in. Now they're really, you really real demand, you can actually get five minutes. And so these are for your, when you're out networking and stuff. You want to have those presentations ready. Um, that's another thing that Kristen and I can kind of help guide you with. You know, did you get it? Is it there? Is it concise? Is it enough in there? Because it's kind of hard to get it down to 30 seconds. Some people think impossible, but it is possible. And then, of course, your capability statement. So when you're going out there and you're, um, these are the basic tools, and then, of course, there's all kinds of other things around it that you have to be prepared to do. But these are just your basic tools, and these are tools that you manipulate, that you move around, that you grow, that, you, that, that are living, breathing documents that are part of your marketing outreach and presentation and trying to get a chance to present yourself in the best light so that you get a chance to be able to win contracts. So when you leave the meeting, they only have your business card and your case statement. So they look at your website for more. So that is the end of the presentation. We've got, got about two minutes. Any other questions? So real quick, the, um, there's one other, there are two quick things I want to show you before you hang up. One of them is this is what we do. Any of you that have already worked with PTAC centers, you've got a sense of it, but we, the one-on-one -on -one counseling at no charge, helping to navigate the government procurement process, and it can be complicated, and especially federal is different from city, which is different from state, which is different from county, so it really help you. We help you around building a strategy to see which one of these should you focus on based on who you are and where you are right now. Many times people want to do it all, and it can be too overwhelming. We have a bid matching service that we are able to provide our clients um, where you'll give us some information and then there's a little computer and little crawlers out there and so you'll get notifications whenever there are opportunities that are available based on the description and the profile that you gave us. 
understanding and you know going through um, a lot of the requirements and stuff that are needed. I'm helping with subcontracting opportunities and a lot more. So we are here to help you with your government contracting strategy. And I have two, we've got some workshops that are coming up um, as we begin to wrap it up. <clears throat> One of them, for those of you out there that are 8A certified or you have other certifications, we're going to um, have a presentation that's going to be done with Michelle Cantor, who's an attorney who can help you to, um, in terms of leveraging that 8A before your nine years run out, but also looking at how you can leverage your other ones. Um, on the 18th, we're doing a workshop in-house on writing winning proposals. On the 19th, we're doing a workshop with Michelle Cantor on um, joint venture and teaming. You may notice that I skipped the 11th. That's because I have a little flyer for the 11th. That we have a workshop on how to develop a risk management plan to protect your business and whether you have a retail business or whether you have um, Another kind of business, there's usually some kind of risk that's involved. So this is going to take place on February 11th. Um, it's an evening meeting with a meal from 5.30 to 7.30. And um, by attending this workshop, we want to um, work with you to teach you the value and the importance of risk management, some of the safety practices and risk reduction strategies that you can use in your business, again, regardless of the kind of business that you have, and then also really look at ways to protect people, property, equipment, vehicles, products, and services in your business. And so this is a, um, a workshop that you also might be interested in that we recommend that you attend. For any of the workshops that I mentioned, um, you can just go to our website to register. Adrian, do you have any lasting comments you want to make? No, again, thank you, uh, thank you, WBDC, for the opportunity, and again, for any of the businesses that uh, wish to contact me, I think Frida had a slide, or if you don't um, have that with my information, I can be reached via email, callahan.adrian at epa.gov, uh, if you have any questions or are seeking to do business with EPA. Right, and it, and, and it is in the slide, it's about the fourth slide. Oh, it's about the fourth slide. Okay. So I believe that's it. We are in. We thank you so much for attending our webinar. We invite you to, uh, you know, sign up and register for any of the other ones that we have coming. As Kristen mentioned, we will send a survey out. It's a short survey. We uh, would appreciate it very much. That's the only thing that we charge for our free webinars is we'd appreciate it very much if you would complete the survey. And then once you finish and hit submit, the presentation will be available. Thank you very much, and everybody have a phenomenal day. Bye-bye.